Hi, welcome to Project Geospatial. I'm Adam Simmons, and this series is Adam and Daryl View the World. And uh, Daryl, take it away for who we have on as a guest this session. Awesome. Hey, Adam, thank you as always. Uh, always a pleasure to uh, to work with you. And uh, uh, it is our extreme pleasure this evening to have uh, Dr. Kelly McHugh with us. Uh, some of you may have seen her publications, and it's Colleen McHugh, uh, but uh, she goes by Kelly, and uh, we are so happy to have an actual analyst online because both Adam and I, by training, <laughs> are in fact, what are we? Analysts. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, analytics. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the things that are involved with you know, how do you birth a real analytic person, right? Uh, that's uh, that's always been a conversation that, you know, Kelly and I have had for a long time. So Kelly, is, Dr. Kelly McHugh is a, uh, you know, she's an image science, data science person. And uh, she works for CACI um, down in North Carolina. And uh, um, Kelly, we are just so happy to have you on the program. I'm absolutely tickled to be here and, and talking data science and analysis is, is just the best thing to be doing on a summer evening, in my opinion. Yeah, it, it's awesome. So, um, so, so Kelly, you know, you sent us some, some great notes ahead of time. I'm like, oh, holy cow. I wish um, I was back in grad school because I would take any number of the things that you put in front of us, right? So I kind of broke them into maybe three big groupings. Um, and you talk about, you know, in, in, in the notes you sent to us, you talked about, you know, the, the kind of the, the, not just analytics, but, you know, how do you put analytics in context? Maybe, you know, before we going to jump straight in, you can talk a little about, a little bit about, you know, how you, your work over the last, say, five years or so has really kind of colored what you've been working on and, and how does that kind of color your your view as a data scientist? One of the things I've seen in the past few years is um, a lot of people have talked about the democratization of, of analytics and you've seen them, the easy button style solutions and the, the concept of a citizen data scientist, which is wonderful because uh, especially when you're looking at predictive analytics, conceptually it's very simple. We wanna confirm and discover things. So we wanna confirm things that we uh, believe are true, test, validate some hypotheses, and then also discover new knowledge. But once you get beyond that in practice, um, it's actually quite difficult. And there are all kinds of different things that you need to be aware of. Everything from, you know, is there bias in my sample? And, and the answer to that is almost always yes. Um, if I go ahead and, and put together an algorithm and it, it's performing really well, I need to be able to understand what the nature, direction, cost, and potential consequences of the errors are so that I can use it effectively and responsibly and, and perhaps mitigate some of the, the potential damage. And what I was realizing is we, and you and I have talked about this a lot, there's a lot of training out there and a lot of buttonology, but very little real education. And we weren't training people to think anymore. And they were coming up with faulty inference. And in some places, um, especially in the, the areas that we work, uh, there's there's consequence. If you get it wrong, um, it's not just that you can't sell as many widgets or whatnot. Um, you know, we're oftentimes dealing with with lives and and things with much larger consequence. So those that's what caused me to pivot. And giving a little bit of my own context, I was originally trained as as a scientist. And no kidding, I wore a lab coat to work for the first several years of my career and was all about the scientific method. And, you know, there was a, a method to doing things. We started with a question. We had brought rigor to the process. We evaluated how well our results worked and 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 had that, that we applied to the questions. And I was seeing that that just wasn't operating as much anymore. And, and I'd like to say I was, you know, it was an epiphany for me personally, but there were a number of people across the community who came to the same conclusion, you know, how do we get that balance between the self-serve, the citizen data scientist, and then making sure that we're accurate, reliable, meaningful, and responsible in our use of these powerful tools. Wow. So, wow, I, I don't even know how to unpack all of that. And so I'm not even gonna, gonna try, 
Um, I, I'm curious, you, you mentioned, you know, citizen scientists, citizen analysts, um, and, 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 you know, you and I have talked, you know, extensively and you were, you know, hugely um, helpful to me as we were working on, um, you know, this concept of soft skills, right? So that's, a, you know, a, something that's, um, I, I can't say it's really terribly taken hold, but it is, in fact, um, my opinion, um, kind of the key to really making a, an analyst, to, to rounding out an analyst's notion of what is success for an analyst, right? So to be able to get an analyst to a point where, um, they can effectively figure out and communicate what it is that they're, you know, that the folks that they have to report to, and that that, that they're 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 creating a an information or an analytic product for whom they're creating that product. You know, what are they looking for, right? So, um, you know, the 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 soft skill pieces that we've talked about are. Um, you know, things like critical thinking and, um, and problem solving and ethics. And, you know, I think of the conversations I've had with, uh, you know, our good colleague, Kathleen McPherson, right? Mm -hmm. Those methodologies, you know, throughout the U.S. government and, and, and internationally, you know, she and Randy have been teaching that for years. And, and I'm curious from your perspective, um, you know, can you talk to us a little bit about, the importance of soft skills in the context of you know, the evolution of what you have seen analysts actually being asked to do. It, it's interesting because I think people are begin to, beginning to appreciate it um, now because there have been so many cases where bias is slipping into some of the algorithms, and especially yeah. when they do things that are incredibly opaque it, it can be really difficult. And you've seen cases of virtual redlining in terms of how uh, real estate ads are served up on social media platforms and those types of things. And I saw a study recently where a number of the big consulting houses did a survey and they realized that the companies, the organizations that were teaching critical thinking and ethics to their technologists those were the ones that were realizing the promise of advanced analytics as a competitive competitive advantage. But I think as we go back, it, our community has been discussing this, uh, I'm thinking going back even to 10 or 15 years. Um, I can remember talking with people about the idea of, of developing master carpenters. So, you know, if all I have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, I'm going to make it look like a nail because that's either the only tool I know how to use or my organization spent a huge amount of money on it. And our discussion was around, let's train the master carpenter. So they've got this, this workbench, and maybe, maybe they need a saw, maybe they need a, a drill press or something like that. But they're able to pick and choose the tools. And not only does that make them more effective, they let the problem guide the solution, but it also creates an analytic agil agility or an intellectual agility so they can evolve as sources, methods, capabilities, technology comes online, including things over the current horizon. So they're not um, developing brittle capacity, if you will. They can ready, readily adopt these new capabilities. So I talked about that. In fact, it's in, in my book. But when you start talking about soft skills, it, it just sounds so unappealing. And especially when you're you're dealing with you know some of the special missions community and some of the more high powered kind of folks, you go all right, let's talk about soft skills. And I think it was Mark Cuban. The article I read, he said, no, these are power skills. And that's what I realized. No, these are like superpower skills. I'm going to load up my utility belt with these things. And so I don't talk about the workbench anymore, the master carpenter. We're all about what's in your utility belt, what can you pull out, because those are the superpower skills that are going to take you up and over the, the hurdles that we have with really hard problems in our community. So for me, it's it's been a little bit of, of marketing. And, I, and the second piece, and I know the, the folks that do training on this on a regular basis really appreciate, is these are not one and done type of skills. You can't just well, I went through a critical thinking course as an undergraduate, I'm good to go. 
It's so much more comparable to physical training, which again resonates really well with the community I work in, where you're not going to go in and have a great, great leg day and every day is a leg day and say, well, I'm done for a couple days or a week or the rest of my career. Similarly, these are things you have to work on continually. So it's going to courses, it's doing training, peer review, critically reviewing someone else's material for me is a great way to work that muscle between your ears and develop and keep your critical thinking skills sharp. But I, I'm really starting to see our community embrace this. And again, looking outside to the commercial data science community, we're realizing that if you're going to have that competitive advantage and the advanced analytics are going to be a differentiator in your organization, you have to have these skills along the entire array. Everyone from your data scientists to your analytic translators, your citizen data scientists, and even your command staff or end users, managers, need to have the skills so that they can be an informed consumer and use these. So, so actually, I, mean, so I think this is a very interesting conversation. I actually, I had no idea what I was to expect when uh, – when Daryl wanted to bring you on. And uh, this, this is actually near dear to my heart because uh, in the military, um, th that's actually how I started my career. Uh, I wasn't just an analyst. I was assigned to a weapons and tactics uh, unit uh, to where we actually studied the workflows of analysts and help understand and champion their workflows. Because what happened was the, the analysts that were put on squadron levels, uh, analysts that were on, on that level, um, we found that they had a hard trial by fire where they were usually the poorest units. They didn't have uh, tool sets that uh, a lot of the bigger companies have or the bigger agencies. They didn't have ArcGIS. They didn't have all these uh, big, heavy, powerful programs. What happened is these, they get these hodgepodge of applications to say, this is what you get, make it work. And, and, and nothing else matters except for getting the mission accomplished. So that's your only goal. We don't really care how you get it done as long as you pump it out in this particular format that the customer wants, and that's it. How you do it, totally up to you. And the innovations that came out of that environment were amazing. And so to me, it's almost second nature coming out of that environment, but but realizing how many people don't have those skills or just get trained on applications where they're told that these specific apps are necessary for you to do your job. And I'm like, well, that's not the case at all. And, mm -hmm. and you're, and, 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 and they don't have those critical thinking skills or because they're not forced to really think about what the problem is more than why well, I don't have this tool. So I can't get the job done. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, so I'm kind of curious to where, what environments, what people do you feel like this is more, uh, these skills are more aimed uh, and where do you see this critical need across the industry? Uh, I think it's, I think it's broad across the industry. I mean, we're hearing people from financial services and, you know, in the commercial sector are again, um, it, it's very easy to get embedded bias, especially with the, the opaque modeling techniques um, and then obviously in our community, it's, it's enormous. But I think one of the things that's really, for me, exciting about data science is it truly is transdisciplinary. And, you know, most of the innovative, and I'm using those air quote things, that I have done in my career has not been truly innovative at all. It's just been repurposing either a, a capability or a, a modeling approach or whatever to a different problem set. And I think that's where the creativity comes from. So I, I think we have the ability to learn from a lot of folks. And I'm seeing a lot of people in our community too. I, I heard Rob Zitz talking about, you know, what a great opportunity we have to use the time that we have available when we're working remotely to look at all kinds of different sources and methods that are available to us. And a number of folks from our community have been looking at um, the COVID data and modeling and, and what kind of approaches are they doing? And it's just absolutely fascinating. There's so many lessons to be learned in terms of different people are counting cases in different ways. The math is different, different types of presentation style. And I'm just collecting all of these as, as teachable moments and sharing them with my colleagues and saying, wow, look what they did here. This is 
this is kind of an interesting way. I wonder if we flip it this way might be useful to us or, oh, hey, um, boy, they, they made a little bit of a mess with this. Let's unpack this and understand, you know, confirmation bias can be really subtle and compelling, but clearly it's not working well for them here. So a lot to learn and do great things. We can understand purpose it. Um, and then also as, as they have errors, I think we have an opportunity to learn from it. And going back to this idea of, of explainable AI, one of the things that's been going on in the commercial sector is you, you have to really understand what's going on. I saw uh, someone from my financial services about a year ago say, if I can't understand the model, I can't explain it. And if I can't explain it to a regulator, then I can't use it. And similarly, in, in our world, um, I can't go to someone, uh, especially when, you know, when the stakes are high and say, oh, well, trust me, you know, the, this is what the confusion matrix look like. It, it's pretty good. You know, I think it's going to be fine. Um, and we're finding that there's not necessarily the amount of lift associated with the more opaque methods as compared to perhaps traditional statistical methods that justifies using something that we can't understand and perhaps don't trust. So, so I'm, I'm really curious, uh, Kelly, mm -hmm. um, when we talk about a data scientist, can you define a data scientist for me? Because <laughs> it, it's quite literally, I'm like, okay, so, right. So my background and training, uh, you know, and folks on, in our audience, I, I'm an image scientist, right? Does that make me a data scientist? I, you know, did you stay on a Holiday Inn Express last night? I, I, mean, I did. It, I feel so it, much smarter. I can hardly contain myself, you know? That's a really interesting and, and controversial, controversial area. Um, there are a lot of us that have been doing this for a long time, and quite a few people like me came out of, of the scientific research community. So I took multivariate statistics and learned machine learning, and those were a means to an end. And then I guess it was in the late 90s, someone coined the term data scientist. And I believe there was an article, you know, it's the sexiest job of the 21st century. And then there were some other folks that started to pile in. And we had, there was a lot of, no, you're not a data scientist. No, if you can't, if you can't code in this language or those types of things, uh, a lot of back and forth. And I believe it was um, McKinsey has a great Venn diagram and they've thrown out and scoped uh, that there are a lot of different flavors of data scientists. And so I, I come at this again, trained as a, as a no kidding bench scientist. So my skill set is gonna be a little bit different than someone who perhaps um, is trained as a, as a no kidding computer scientist. And I am so grateful to be able to work with them. And then similarly, there are other people who are good at data management and we're realizing, again, going back to this transdisciplinary nature, uh, pulling folks together with these slightly different but complementary skills, it, it's a team sport. And those, I think, are the best data science teams. And even the, the data translator, the analytics translator, those folks are enormously important in terms of going to the end user, looking at the challenge, pulling out the word problem, being able to speak to the to the people that are putting the algorithm together and then go back and forth to make sure it works. So very much a team sport. I think this idea that you're going to have a unicorn that has every single skill, um, people are understanding that you're far better to get folks with those complementary skills to work together. So and I don't know the answer to that, but I think we're evolving beyond what is a data scientist specifically? So Mike Groschel, who was a, a guest on one of our previous segments, um, he and I worked together for about a year, about literally about 12, 14 months or so. And, um, you know, he and I used to have these conversations about how, you know, what, what is better, right? So if you're, a, if you're a manager, what is better? Is it better to, um, to help your your the folks that you manage um, learn complementary skills so they fill out their profile so they can be more well-rounded and can and, and can contribute from a lot of different directions or is it better to assemble a team with 
with the constituent parts of of folks that have you know really good you know complementary skill sets between them or amongst them. Um, and, and, and we would have these really long philosophical conversations, but, you know, what I kind of learned over time, you know, as a manager was, uh, I literally kind of did it in 180, where I used to think the former and I learned the latter. I'm curious what your take is from a data science perspective. What do you do in terms of assembling a team to be able to attack a problem? I, um, I, some of the best teams that I have seen, and, and again, I came into all this a little orthogonally myself, so I've got kind of this you know, self-serving bias going on, but I, some of the most amazing teams that I've seen, um, there was a, a team locally where they had someone who had a doctor in climate science, and then they had other people with material science, and they were really creative people that liked solving hard problems and were really good at being able to step back and see the bigger picture and say, well, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a really challenging problem. But, you know, I know something from radio astronomy and I was watching Nova two weeks ago and I saw this program on it. And I think if we go and we look at that, we can repurpose it. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan. And I know, uh, I'm not going to speak for him, but John Elder has talked a little bit about getting some of these non-obvious talent sets. And when they have that, I like to work on hard problems. I, I want it to be a little bit different maybe every time. And, you know, I think we can repurpose things. For me, those have been the most exciting teams to not only be on, but also to lead. They, they can be a challenge, too, because... You know they're they're really kind of playing around the edges and keeping them working moving forward. Um, you know takes you don't want to crush their spirit, but you have to get things done. But um, those are the kinds of teams that I found doing that truly disruptive insight. So would you say that it's easier? And, and uh, you know if if you have an example, it'd be. Great. If you don't, I, I understand because we understand the environment we work. Um, but you an example of where, um, you know, where this kind of complementary skill set that you described, where that is actually, in your opinion, benefited the outcome? I, I again, I'm one of those people that. I'm watching Nov all the time. I'm finding things in um, in the financial services, looking at um, you know how do they do marketing and how do you you know. So I I look at at behavior and in most cases the behavior I'm looking at is is bad and undesirable. But understanding how you can look at and, and characterize and model in support of data-informed anticipation and influence. I spent a lot of time looking at the marketing literature and understanding how you can, um, you know, segment and better understand the different market segments, if you will, and then perhaps apply that type of analytic framework to, to other areas. Oh, yeah. It goes back, you know, basically in we know from statistics, if you throw everything together in kind of big mass, um, you know, you lose a lot of the subtleties and the variance. Sometimes parsing a little bit more gives you some some different insight. And there, there can be a real fine uh, craft to that in you know, a lot of subtlety and nuance. And, and I think the marketing in the business community and, and also communi uh, communicating their results, you know, what was it Robert Cardillo said? Uh, too complicated, too bad. You look at some of the people that are uh, have to brief uh, regulators or brief the board or need to explain to customers and other end users what they're doing. There's just some amazing visualization techniques. And uh, and one of the things when I, when I teach in our community, um, we go through a, a course on critical thinking. And as we get to the end, the... 
um, you know, their end users haven't had the benefit of, of spending time with me, so they don't know about critical thinking and all those types of things. So how do we, as analysts, um, create analytic products that are that can be interpreted accurately, reliably, quickly? How do we create cognitive ease, which is something they do quite a bit in marketing? But you know, ideally, we want our end user to be able to. facing our nation. So there's, um, you know, I didn't learn that in our community. I, I had to reach out to, to learn from, um, you know, cognitive psychology, behavioral economics. Daniel Kahneman comes from behavioral economics, and that's someone that I think everyone in our community either has read or should read. So you know, everybody, everybody, poly, polymath like you, right? So it, those of us that are just kind of pedestrian folks, um, you know, we, 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 uh, I, I bow in your general direction because um, it, it's, it, it, it's heartening for me to know somebody like you who is, you know, you know, deep into um, data and data analytics um, really cares about, continuing to learn, right? So my wife, so you understand, my wife is a um, inveterate learner and she is a biology teacher. She's, she teaches AP and team taught biology. Um, and the reason I bring that up to you is that, you know, because it's a, um, uh, there's going to be a question at the end of this. So there will be a way. <laughs> So the reason I bring it up is um, she deals with kind of two ends of the intellectual spectrum. She deals with folks that are going off to college and Ivy League uh, folks in terms of uh, their, their, you know, the seniors that she has in her advanced placement biology class. And she also deals with uh, folks that have learning challenges in ninth grade. Wow. And um, I'm really curious from your perspective, you know, how do we, you know, kind of bridge this gap between uh, mm -hmm. it, it, what she has to do on a daily basis. And, you know, she's prepping. She lives in Fairfax County. That's where we live. Um, Fairfax County, Virginia. And, um, and we went all virtual. And the day that that happened, um, um, I said, okay, so she needs some time to be able to kind of process all this. So I took my my two boys and our 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 our, our eight month old dog, and I literally left, so she could build curricula and attend all the seminars, et cetera, that were going to basically move her world from being a combination of uh, online learning and and a, a lot of hands on work to virtual only. Fairfax County is now virtual only for the next calendar year. Wow. So I'm, I'm wondering from your perspective, you know, given where we sit right now and given all of what you just described in terms of the kind of ideal I, way of being able to incorporate different views and different, and different abilities from a, um, from an analytic perspective, how do you incorporate those differences in a truly 100% virtual environment? Wow. Um, yeah, we're all working in a virtual environment. You see, I'm, I'm a big hand waver and things. Um, so, yeah. you know, a lot of what I, I'm finding, too, it's, it's interesting that you would bring this up. Um, when I do training... I'm a big believer in getting people moving up and around. And we know that the longer you sit, your brain just kind of goes dead. And one of the first things I do when I kick off a training is I have these little paper bags with the impossible puzzle. And I've been using these probably for 25, 30 years at this point. Not the same puzzles. But the idea where the students a bag full of puzzle pieces and they're incomplete they have extra pieces, and it's it's just a great model for what we do because you have, you know, rarely, I, I've never been in a position where someone said, here's all the data you're going to need, and it's complete, and it's here all at once, 
um, you have extra information, um, you have missing information, and it's interesting to see how they move around the room and they collaborate and they work together and they realize that they've each got different pieces and um, I can't do that anymore. And it doesn't translate well to, you know, imagine if you will, I'm handing you these bags. And so I'm having to relearn all that, but even backing up um, the first edition of my textbook, learning to create models of homicide and violent crimes for years. And I've been publishing in the academic journals and I've been speaking at academic conferences. But after 9-11, I realized that we had to figure out a way for your average intel analyst or beat cop or whoever it was to understand. Uh, on 9-11, I was up at one of the agencies learning how to do association matrices and link charts using pencil and paper. And I knew that there were better ways. And the challenge was how do we translate this knowledge so the people who are actually working for a living can use it to change outcomes for us from a public safety and national security perspective. So that is why I wrote the book. And it was, um, the working title was Data Mining for Door Kickers, and that they renamed it. But I wanted analysts and the people that supervised them and the people that would be buying software to be informed consumers and have that, that uh, analytic process in place so they could pick good tools, they could push away the snake oil salesmen, and that they would be positioned to d adopt in, and incorporate those tools. And I've continued to take that approach, and I do a fair amount of training, but it's, it's so important to be able to translate these concepts. And, and that's how I got into to geospatial, um, was I realized the you know, to quote uh, Abe Usher, the geospatial environment is an incredibly powerful transdisciplinary collaboration environment. And I could, I put together algorithms and I would give the output and they were really nice to, pe to me, but they would, you know, the cops would roll their eyes back in their head and say, well, what am I supposed to do with this? Putting it in a map, rendering it in a map, made it operationally relevant and actionable. So going back to your question, I see this current environment as, yes, we have another challenge but the requirement is far too important for us to just kick back and say, well, it's hard or this will be over at some point. We need to embrace the opportunity and I need to figure out how to not even replicate that experience with the mystery bags, but how do we make it even better so that when we come to the other side, folks are still learning, they're still embracing the knowledge and being good critical thinkers so that they can do their job better. So, you know, I, I'm going I'm to ask you and Adam kind of the same question. And I, 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 I'm, I'm curious to I really want to hear this response. Right. So um, when we we talk about complete virtual environments, um, you know, data are always always going to be brought up as being, oh, I can't get access to data X, Y, Z. I'm like, you're right. You can't. OK. My answer to, to folks that say that is like, so what? Mm -hmm. What can you tell me given the current environment? I don't care that you can't get used to what you can't get to what you're used to getting to. And from a data perspective, from a uh, completely unclassified in a wide open environment perspective, what are the things that uh, we can get in touch with? Um, that would allow us to be able to actually provide value to our customer base. I, I've been one of those people complaining for years that we needed to spend more time in the unclassified space. The, the data that were available, uh, the technology, some of the methods, and even some of the people, you know, to the ability to, to attract, recruit, retain talent right now is is challenging and being a cleared 
professional is a lifestyle choice in many ways. And, and we've talked about this a lot and I've done a lot of work with um, the USGIF on this is not everybody wants to do it. It's, it's not terribly attractive to some of the young people, but how do we bring them in and, and create opportunities for them to support the mission? So then all of a sudden in March, boom, you know, now you've got your opportunity. It was a little precipitous, but, you know, we are looking at all types of, um, you know, people are taking, we're able to use different types of data sources, different types of capabilities. And, you know, I saw Tish Long wrote an article on it recently. I know Rob Zitz spoke about it, webcast. You know, we can, we can sit here and say, well, it's not really, you know, I wanted it this way. Or you can say, no, embrace the opportunity. The mission goes on. We still have requirements to serve and analyze. Um, so we have to do something, but why not do something amazing? And, you know, what, what would happen if we came to the other side and we now realize that, no, we can actually put together a very effective, perhaps integrated environment. And, and I know, you know, there have been a lot of people much smarter than I am who specialize in, you know, kind of crisis leadership and whatnot and, you know, talk about this idea of, not even the next normal, but the series of next normals. And, I, you know, the people that I work with, I know a number of my teammates at CACI and then some of the organizations that we support, you know, we're all about right now, hey, you know, given, like you said, given what we have available, given the environment, the constraints or whatnot, um, what can we do now? And, and frankly, you know, working as a cleared professional, we should be used to the fact that we're always working within statutory requirements and constraints. So they're just a little bit different. Um, you know, we need to pull up our knickers and, and move forward and, and innovate and see what we come to the other side with. So, so Adam, you know, you and I have talked about the fact that, you know, DOD just came out with a, uh, um, a directive that said uh, commercial first, right? So consider commercial first and then work towards non-commercial sources. Um, I'm really curious from your perspective as a, you know, a, a another analyst, right? So we have, you know, Kelly as a, an, an uber data scientist, but you as a, a you know an exquisite analyst, you know, as we look at that directive, what does that mean from a, the, the perspective of okay, so we have you know we have these soft skills that we kind of started out our discussion with. What does that really mean from the perspective of um, you know critical thinking specifically? Let, let's talk about critical thinking. Does it change anything? To, you know, uh, you know, if when we have um, you know sources and methods that we can only access on certain networks, does that limit us, um, or does that provide us more exquisite information? So you laid on a lot of questions there, and I got to filter that out a little bit. So, uh, but there's a lot of overlap with. Uh, Oh, wait, wait. so so let's let's see here. Um, first of all, I, I think yeah, unclassified work first makes a lot of sense to me. However, uh, is there a difference between what data you get from the unclassified side from uh, compared to the inside? In my personal opinion, it's this is a lot of it's philosophical, and uh, yes, a lot of the methodologies and a lot of the sources are different. But I'd argue that it would it takes the creativity in trying to figure out uh, what the overlap, sorry, I got family in the background. <laughs> so, uh, so, so it takes the creativity of people to realize th how to translate and uh, what the problems are on the inside into what the equivalent problems are on the outside. Because I think there always is a one-to-one -one. and in, uh, in, I literally, I, there hasn't been a problem on the inside that I have not been able to find some kind of equivalent for on the outside. And that really goes a long way of trying to explain to people what the art of the, the, art of the possible is. Uh, and so what I find though is it's not necessarily policy on the top. 
It's not even security that's the biggest issue. I think I find that it's more dogma and traditions that exist on the bottom level that prevent uh, a lot of these changes to uh, take place on the uh, on the government side or or even contractors working on the inside to even take advantage of methodologies and pulling stuff in. Um, that's what I've seen. Just just people who are maybe hardened in their ways and they're not that they're not creative, but they feel uh, timid to take these approaches because uh, they can, they, they voice either consider security concerns or I don't know how to do this where it's going to be allowed. And, um, and maybe there's some creative thought that needs to take place in allowing these people to think more freely um, and just, use the data source and run with it. Um, but I think there's, 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 those are the stovepipes that I see. Uh, it's not that you can't do things on the end class. Uh, it's it just people, people aren't thinking hard enough on what those problems are uh, on the outside. The, the, those equivalents are literally it, name something that we can talk about and I can find, I can find the equivalent problem easy. I can't hear you, Allison. Are you muted? Did you mute yourself, Mer Daryl? Did you mute yourself? No, I, I I didn't. But you know, we have the vagaries of uh, of, of 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 fabulous telecom. So can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you now. <laughs> okay. Cool. Uh, so so Kelly, given what Adam just said, I'm curious. Um, you know, so one of the things I learned along the way, uh, I spent a couple of years on site um, with a with a at, at a government agency, and, and and I learned a lot during my time there. And uh, it, it what was really cool is that you know there was one phrase, one that was ubiquitous. What problem are we trying to solve? Right. It it, it came from Steve Blank. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just a deep blank question that he had uh, had posed uh, a number of years ago, and it became sort of like the battle cry. And I found myself using it today in a conversation uh, with a bunch of my colleagues that we were we were talking about demos that they're building. And I said, OK, so, guys, um, what problem are you trying to solve? How often do you ask yourself as a data scientist that particular question? A, a lot. And I find myself saying a lot of times, in fact, I said it about four times yesterday, is this looks like a solution looking for a problem. And, you know, I right. think, you know, it, it's it's a real challenge. I, I'm a huge fan of um, the Heilmeyer questions. And I had posters of them made. I love the Heilmeyer questions. I keep those on my, on my the badges that I wear. I have that yes. whole thing. All seven questions sitting right there. Yeah. And I think, and again, going back to, you know, what parallels can we find outside our community? Um, you know, what else has been done? The, you need to do market research. So, you know, what what is your question? What question, what problem are you trying to solve? That is first and foremost. You know, what else has been done before? Why is this different? That's, you know, I think sometimes... Um, the pressure of having a return on investment requirement is, is a real useful thing because you can't just do something because it's interesting or because I found a catchy name for my tool and I want to build to it. Or, you know, there's a real requirement to build things that are answering a question and to make sure that they, they're developed to fruition, they work as advertised, that there are actual performance metrics associated with it that you're answering the question you originally posed. So yeah, the questions are enormous and we have posters of those hanging where I work. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, Heilmeyer, for those that that, 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 that might not know, um, that is, you know, it, it's it's sort of the, um, 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 the Rosetta Stone, um, if you will, for DARPA. Mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, and and for those of you, if you don't know what DARPA is, D A R P A, go ahead and look it up, and look up Heilmeyer at H E I L M E I R. I think um, if I got it right, and um, 
Um, we, we'll try to post that in the show notes, but too. <laughs> we will. That would be great. But, but, but what's, what's, what was awesome about these set of questions is basically just sort of like, you know, uh, a set of questions that you can ask him any problem that you're like, you know, concerned to, to try to actually really answer. Right. Mm-hmm. So it, it really gets to the fundamental of why are you even bothering asking these questions in the first place? And, um, um, you know, when we talk about, you know, what problem are you trying to solve? I, I think of, uh, you know, several of my colleagues that I worked with previously and, uh, you know, Steve blank that, that kind of created that question, you know, what problem you're trying to solve? Um, really it, it, it gets to the heart of two different things from a data science perspective. It's not only what are you trying to get to from an analytic perspective, but what is the relevance of that analytic to the people that are actually paying the bills? Mm-hmm. Let me say that second part again, right? So, so Kelly, talk to us a little bit about paying the bills, right? So if you're not answering questions that the bill payers are interested in having answers to, well, why are we, why are we bothering, Right. It, it's interesting. People that I work with learn really quickly because they would say, well, well, no, we're, we're like a think tank or we're doing big science wow. research. It's like, uh, let me, st- I, let me stop myself. you for a moment. Yeah. It, it, you know, that's the world I came from. And boy, I, you know, I came from a lab that was uh, based on NIH yeah. research funding. And if you think, you know, that, that we have a lot of people looking at the bills and expecting progress it's like that that line from uh, ghostbusters you know they expected results that that's an incredibly competitive demanding environment so no there's no place for that um you know in in my experience and i i am not at all sympathetic no we need to we need to do projects we need to have clear objectives we have to be answering a question there needs to be requirements for it and we need to be able to show progress because at the end of the day um Again, you know, maybe I'm not selling enough um, widgets. Uh, that that's all well and good for those folks, but it, but in our world, uh, you know, bad data, bad analytic results. Um, people don't come home at the end of the tour, so uh, you know, we just don't have the luxury of wasting time, resources, or money, and it and it's the people's money too. Yeah, you know, it's so you know that's that that last little bit. Right, and when we talk about the people's money, it's our, you know, it's our community money. It's at our taxpayer dollars that are at work. So the problems that we're trying to solve, right? It, it, you know, we go back to the, you know, the the, the catechism, right? We call we, we call it the Hellmeyer questions, but it can be called the Hellmeyer catechism, right? It, that's literally if you Google it, just look it up. It, it, it sits right there, and um, it is when you're doing applied research, not basic research, right? And there's a very dis very huge chasm between the two and, and it sort of bothers me in a, in a, in a way from um, uh, philosophic maybe is not the right word um, from a um, from a pragmatic standpoint I believe we need both basic and applied research the challenge is how do you make that transition between basic and applied and even more so how do you make the cha- make the transition from applied to um to purchased right mm-hmm. so if i have research that i'm doing right so i have a bae i respond to right so for those listeners that are out there that are you know, they're, 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 they see a baa that's out there uh, a broad area announcement, and, and it, perhaps there is an analytic component to it. And they're like, oh, this is what my company does. Great. Okay. Super. So the question that you have to ask yourself is, who is on the other end of that particular BAA, right? And are they willing to purchase what it is that you're actually selling? It's a really simple kind of question that – you know, we that 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 do the you know, the deep analytics, and especially folks like you, Kelly, that are you know embedded with customers that actually um, have a, a huge huge stake in the outcome of your analytic. The question ultimately comes down to is who's going to plunk money down to buy what you're selling? 
at the end of the day, that that's key. And and also, you can't buy everything. So anything that's purchased is usually at the expense of something that that didn't make the cut. So being very sensitive to that and appreciating it. But I think your point too about the difference between basic and applied research, and then something that's fit for prime time. Um, that's an incredibly heavy lift. And as someone, you know, I mentioned earlier, I started out doing basic, basic science research, uh, was putting together models, they performed well, we were able to model homicide and violent crimes, but then environment was really difficult. It is one of the hardest things I've ever done, the most valuable and satisfying, but it, at the end of the day, if someone can't use the work that you've done, it's it's like an analytic version of a tree falling in the woods with no one there to hear it. And we just don't have, um, we don't yeah. have extra resources and it compromises mission. So, you know, you know so for, for our listeners out there, uh, it's, you know, one of the, the things that, you know, I, I consider Kelly like the goddess of community policing. Right. So, you know, that's what, you know, so my introduction to Kelly, you know, years ago was when she was, you know, literally writing the book on community policing. Right. So I'm going to talk about your second edition fabulous book that we'll post in our in our in our, uh, um, you know, you know, postscript here. Um, but, you know, I from simply investigating what Kelly had been working on. I learned a tremendous amount about the importance of um, communication in community policing. So, Kelly, I, I want to come all the way back, right, to where we kind of started this conversation, which was about soft skills. And we kind of – this is what happens when Kelly and I always get together. And, you know, anytime I have a conversation with Adam, it never well, – goes in the direction that we we think it's going to go right so, so daryl um, so, real quick yeah so so i want to add something in there because i know you're going to transition kind of completely but i want to i want to add something in on that business side real quick and and yeah, and where i think another question that people forget about is competitive analysis and mm. that's a big thing. And, and to me wow. like i said going through master's classes in business and, and, and even yeah. bachelor's in business, that's, that's like one-on-one stuff, but I can't believe how many companies don't, and actually, you know, people who research workflows, analytic workflows, forget about competitive analysis when they try to research new products mm-hmm. or new, uh, new analytic tools to put out there. And, and it's not just important to figure out what other tools exist. It's also the f- important to figure out what the analysts are currently using from the ground level. What I mean by that is I want to go back to that analogy I gave at the beginning where uh, where, uh, where I, I was helping military analysts figure out uh, with their workflows. Is Typically, we'd have a company, bigger company, bigger defense contractor company said, hey, we got an awesome tool for you because we know you don't have it. We <laughs> literally know you don't have it. And, and they were right. We, they, they, we didn't have it. But they didn't realize – that we were using this patchwork of tools that worked very efficiently Um, or something out of the box that was pre-installed on our operating system that was completely free. Like you talk about Microsoft Paint, or, or, uh, or I like, I, I like the analogy of a, a Microsoft, um, movie maker. We had a big defense contractor who offered us a video maker, uh, the four full motion video millions of dollars. They was like, this is awesome. You can imp- bring the feed in, cut out clips, send it to your customers. Like, well, I can do it for free in five minutes or less and spit it out the door to my customer right now. And they're like, well, how? I'm like, and they never did the analysis to figure out what tools we have out of the box. Not even that we purchased, but what tools we had right in front of us that we took advantage of that because we didn't want to use the big tools. They were not, not efficient or because we didn't have it, we had to make it up ourselves. So that competitive analysis, I, I feel like it's left out a lot, but, but on the ground level too. So I want to put that in there and add that to the conversation because I think that was a missing question uh, from a business side that a lot of people forget about. So, wow. That, you know, competitive analysis, right? So, you know, it, it, from a data science perspective, how do you address that, Kelly? Curious. 
Oh, man. Um, you know, I think I mentioned earlier, you know, one of the things I do in the, the critical thinking and problem solving training that I do, I know a lot of my colleagues at CACI are working with their the organizations they support as well is how do you create the truly informed consumer? And some of that's the critical thinking skills, understanding how things work, how, how do you compare them um, together? Uh, Going back to what we were discussing earlier, though, also is, um, you know, there's the competitive analysis between products, but then there's also the competitive analysis between modeling approaches. And there are, there's a lot of hype right now about AI and deep learning and all these different things. And you end up with these incredible products and the models are very interpreted and understand how they're working. And to deconflict bias, um, and and we're starting to see more papers now coming out where people are using um, traditional statistical methods and running them against AI and deep learning, and they're finding that there's very little lift, and that can be really challenging because if everybody else is using AI and we want to use it as well because that's what everybody else is using. And be able to say, well, now I think if you just do a simple logistic regression, you're going to get to the same endpoint. Plus, you're going to be able to show it to your end user. They're going to be able yeah. to push it around. Trust so competitive analysis and and Hallmark calls it out too. That's that background that you need to do to understand why yours is new and needed and different, and what the differentiator is going to be. But there's a, I believe, a big bucket of that that's comparing the different technologies, approaches, and whatnot. And, and in, in our, my experience and my colleagues, um, we're finding that, that the informed end user is a great partner, um, especially because then they can, they can sort out the snake oil from the capabilities or, that are actually going to bring value to the organization and support the mission. Right. So I, 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 I just wrote down, you know, as I'm taking notes from, you know, I always learn so much when it, when, when we chat. Um, I, I think that of all the things that we've talked about so far, the following phrase is one that for me is, oh my goodness, it is absolutely the bullseye. How do you create the truly informed consumer? You said that, by the way. Um, and whether it's, you know, um, intentional or not, that is probably about as spot on as I've ever thought in my mind in terms of what are we trying to actually do, right? Are, are we trying to, you know, solve problems? What problem are we trying? So what we're really trying to do is make sure that our consumer, right, of whatever analytic product service, whatever that looks like, um, is informed so they can interpret what we present to them in a way that actually is meaningful to them and the problem they are addressing. Right. So man, you just gave me like light <laughs> at the end of the tunnel. Right. So that is exactly it. That's it right there. So, so I'm going to put you on the spot. Right. Right. So taking what, 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 what Adam said, which I love, right. Which is, you know, competitive analysis. How do you create a, a truly informed consumer that also takes into consideration commercial processes that they may not otherwise be aware of? And I, I know I ended a sentence with a preposition, but shoot me, right? I, in my experience, it, it occurs at Continually, you know, when you think in terms of um, services work and high touch business consulting, you know, from every step of the way. And and I approach a lot of this like a, a layered approach to marketing. I mentioned that, um, you know, we have posters hanging. We do training. I send out these little notes called the Q-tips. Um, I'm probably gonna. They're probably gonna get a cease and desist nice. letter from people that make cotton swabs for saying that. Uh, I'm but not sure, but you know, um, if, no one's swimming if I'm, that make a yeah, problem. Yeah. If I'm not educating 
every step along the way, then then they're not getting what then I'm not I'm not the professional that I that I should be um, working in this environment. And so we will do everything from formal training, um, explaining it at the beginning when when we're talking about a project that's going to start and and saying, well, I'm going to do it this way. And this is my thought process. You know, we'll walk through the, the Hallmark questions. Um, and, and when I talk to analysts as well, the analytic pro the engagement needs to be bracketed with education in the beginning and the end, when you're talking about the analytic requirements and what they're looking for. And then at the end, there needs to be education as well. And then the analytic work product. Similarly, they need to understand in the beginning I made you cross these lines because then the analysis falls apart or it's not used. And education should be at, at every step. And as I mentioned before, too, you know, I do a lot of training with our folks on a regular basis ad hoc, on the floor, um, in the classroom, and whatnot. But I reinforce regularly your end users haven't had the benefit of the you know, pearls of wisdom that I'm dropping. So you need to go that extra mile to make sure you educate them. And then the, the win on that, though, is your personal brand and the brand of your group gets improved every single time you put something good out there. And, and that, you know, you can feel good about that and maybe it makes you feel special. But I work for data. I like to solve the hard problems. So from a very selfish perspective, the better my brand is and the better the brand of my group is, the more interesting work we're going to get. So if we, if, if we educate our folks and we play above the rim, then when the really interesting problems come down, they're going to say, hey, we need to go get that group because we know it's going to be good and we know that they're going to be able to handle the interesting stuff. So, uh, so Kelly, you know, I, I can't begin to thank you enough for spending time with us tonight. Uh, you know, we've just really scratched the surface. Um, I'm hoping you you'll come back in the very near future, and uh, you know, I I, I, I I could spend another like four hours talking to you about these topics. Um, you know, we just you know we just, you know, just you know, literally. Gave everybody a crash course in an hour on you know data analytics and the importance of 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 maybe non analytic issues um, as it relates to data anal analytics and um, um, I'm hoping to come back um, in the real near future and and and, and talk with Adam and, and and me maybe about a uh, one of the pieces that we talked about here is I, I love this you know how do you create a truly informed consumer of data analytics, I'm going to put it, right? And, um, you know, but, you know, thank you so much for taking time with us, uh, Adam. Yes, thank you very much. I, uh, I I want to thank you as well. Uh, I know our listeners on the show are pretty diverse, but a lot of these topics are things that are underspoken. They don't, they don't get talked about a lot. They're, they're on the back of everybody's minds as they do their workflows, they do their work. And, um, and, and people think sometimes it's, people just tune in sometimes and think this is a general discussion, but this is the kind of thing. If you listen just for two minutes in the conversation, you're like, you, you get sucked into cause this is what you deal with on a daily basis uh, as an analyst or as somebody who's like, why isn't my job or why isn't my, uh, why isn't my workflow progressing enough? What's what's going on? Why isn't why isn't the uh, team moving forward on new ideas, create creative methods, uh, and these are all things that they can think about and uh, have those discussions internally as well. So yeah. once again, thank you for joining us on Project Geospatial, um, and uh, I'm gonna we should, we should just end it right there, right? We're, we're over the time. <laughs> Kelly, any last thoughts? You know, um, you know, um, we're gonna we're gonna post a bunch of stuff on the uh, uh, on the on the recording for the uh, the pop podcast and the webcast in case you want to be able to listen or or watch the uh, the session on and uh, including you know your your you know second edition book on data mining and, and, and <laughs> uh, so yeah so we, we we're gonna we're gonna you know we're gonna pimp that for you it's all good you know thank um, you this has been a blast.
Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. And then uh, stay tuned till uh, next time. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Thank you.